morning. And at this time, we have some special music. This one, correct? and top hat. <laughs> we are uh, back in Exodus here this morning, Exodus chapter 20. I know that uh, we kind of started or found ourselves at the base of, of Mount Zion last week as we continued on with our journey. And uh, I mentioned that it's not my intention to go through all of, all of the aspects of the law as it's given to them there. Uh, but there are some specific things that I think are important to go over in, in that regard. Um, that the Lord actually in this case continually reminds them there probably is no more often repeated command than the one we're going to be looking at here this morning uh, beginning in the actual Ten Commandments thereafter reminded again and thereafter again and again and then as they would finish their 40 years of wandering be on the shores uh, of the Jordan, looking over into that promised land, Moses would set, gather them all together and remind them some more times. And yet it was something that, frankly, they fell to even before they left the mountain, and then as well something that they would continue to fall as they conquered the land. And I, I think it behooves us, if that's a good word to use, it behooves us, they consider the very reality that if, if it is something that is so easy for them to fall into, could it not be for us as well? If it's something that they had to be continually reminded about, is it not something that we should as well? Especially as we're trying to tie it together in, in responding to chaos, responding to confusion, responding to the scenarios that we fall into. And uh, so what we want to look at here is I, actually the first two commandments uh, and then repeated right after the commandments are given and uh, again repeated throughout uh, the basic uh, concept of, of idolatry. Uh, knowing, uh, knowing the uh, reality of, of idolatry, how easy it is for us to fall into it. And I know this is going to seem like, oh, here we go. <laughs> uh, I've already heard messages on idolatry. I, I think this will be a little different and I, I trust that it is a challenge to us this morning but before we do let's be with the word of prayer lord we thank you again for your word i thank you for your uh, challenge to our hearts for our lives i pray that we would be able to examine our own hearts and determine how often it is that like the children of israel we we fall into our own devices we fall into how our own means of of worship to you 
And I just pray that you would remind us in, in these verses of the seriousness of, of who you are, ultimately, uh, that our lives would be evidence of the very reality of a, of a clear understanding of who you are. And uh, I pray that you would challenge us in that regard here this morning. I pray that you allow me to decrease so that you alone would increase here this morning. And I pray that you'd be honored um, by all that's said and done here now. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a uh, ancient Indian story, uh, tale, I guess you could call it, that as I give it to you, you're going to, like I did as well, wonder what in the world is wrong with the ancient Indians. <laughs> Uh, but this tale uh, that apparently was common to them in ancient times is very applicable to this, these next several verses. So let me give it to you. Ancient Indian tale says that there were four royal brothers who parted ways in order to find something significant that they could do to contribute to their known world at that time. And uh, so they, uh, they parted their separate ways and having been gone and, and having mastered specific trades, they decided to gather back together and kind of impress each other with what they have learned. And so brother number one, surely the oldest brother, uh, kind of as they gather back together, um, declares, I have mastered a science. I can take a bone, any bone, and I can add flesh back to that bone. And uh, the other brothers kind of were in awe and amazement. The second brother uh, kind of blurts out, that's absolutely interesting. I know how to grow that creature's skin and hair if there is at least flesh on a bone. The third one thought for a moment and, and then hollered out, that is absolutely fascinating. I learned how to create limbs where limbs once were, but I need flesh and skin on hair on a bone. The fourth one, with almost too much excitement for him to contain, were cries out, Tremendous! I learned how to give life back to that which was dead. So the four of them looked at each other for a moment and then had this grand idea, let's go into the jungle and find ourselves a bone and uh, see how, how this works. So they found themselves a bone. Uh, the first one added flesh. The second one added the skin and the hair. The third one added the limbs. And then the youngest one created life back within that which obviously was just a bone not that long before. Inadvertently, he gave life back to a lion. Oops, yes. Upon gaining that life, uh, the lion shook its mane, <laughs> roared for the first time, and then devoured all four of its creators and wandered contently off back into the jungle. You know how uh, tragic, I just can't imagine uh, uh, ancient Indians gathered around the uh, uh, campfire sharing that story. It just seems uh, rather uh, bizarre to me. But on the, uh, the spiritual realm, on the, uh, just the aspect of life itself, each one of us has the power to create that which can and most often will devour us, consume us. And we have to be very cautious in, in that regard to what is it that is... Uh, a kind of uh, a controlling our time, controlling our mind, controlling our objective of controlling our vantage point of our future, because more than likely that which we allow to control us will devour us. And uh, these four brothers had learned allegedly some marvelous tricks of the trade, so to speak, some marvelous, as they said, science. But it wound up being to their demise, and how often we do the same. Now, kind of the, uh, from a different angle, when you consider all that's going on in our, our world today, in our nation today, I think we can come to several conclusions. Number one, obviously, uh, every person alive is in pursuit today of his own God, capital G or little g, and sometimes even with an S at the end. Every single person alive today, us in this room, and those here in this town that aren't in a church, those in the next church over, every single person alive today is in pursuit of their God. I don't think that can be denied. Do we grasp that when we, were, when we are in pursuit of the Almighty God, the one and true God, that He alone has the power to transform us, to change us? But do we also grasp the fact that for those who are in pursuit of their own God, little g, that to a much lower extent, 
because there's no power behind it other than their own mind and will, that they too are changed to an extent to their desire of their God, if that makes sense. So we pursue the Almighty God. He changes us from within. And uh, that's biblical. We, we see that throughout the Word of God. We are, to be we are not to be conformed, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that with, from within. But if I am in pursuit of a, of a different God, let me, let me just throw out, uh, we have lots of ideas for God. Let's just say materialism. If my God is materialism, I want to be as wealthy as wealthy can be. Does not that pursuit of wealth begin to change us to some extent? Do, do we not then begin to have a, a, a different uh, a demeanor, a, a different attitude, even in our reactions with each other, begin to come tweaked and changed because of what our pursuit of our God is? That being said, kind of a, a third rule or, or, or point, would it, could it not also be said that the structure of our society then for each one of us is based on the pursuits of our God. Now, I know this all sounds very philosophical, but do we not desire to create in our own world, however big that might be, it might just be to the end of our nose, but do we not all desire to create our own world that mirrors the pursuit of our God, capital G or little g? In other words, I would think the ideal world would be that uh, uh, our public schools would be as they once were, where uh, they started with prayer, and uh, they were intended for the, as the founding was for public school system, the founding of teaching our children how to read so they can read the Word of God. I think that would be a marvelous reality. <laughs> I think that would be a great society. And in my pursuit of the one true almighty God, my desire would be that the world that we live in, at least the community that we live in, would be able to mirror my pursuit of my God. And I would dare say that, that we're all like that. Uh, uh, certainly, we rejoice when there's legislation that uh, seems to coincide with that which we agree with. And we sorrow and uh, uh, do what we can as far as our, uh, our, the privilege we have to vote when legislation is passed that we're in disagreement with. Because we desire, number one, we're in pursuit of God. We know that God begins to change us. Almighty God, the one true God, changes us from within, but pursuits of all gods, little g, does change us. And we desire for our society to be a mirror of our pursuit of that God. So then you look at uh, even uh, politics, and it kind of begins to explain how there can be such differences of opinion, different platforms, uh, even within parties, such differences. Uh, begins to explain what in the world is going on with Black Lives Matter and, and all that's going on here today. Uh, ultimately, if we wanted to simplify it to its most simple form, we have the reality of great evidence of pursuits of God's little g and a desire to transform their society to one that agrees with the pursuits of their God. What is lacking today in our nation is the pursuit of the one true God. Very similarly to what the nation of Israel were about, they obviously are learning in this journey and they continue to learn for the next 40 years uh, uh, who their true God was, who that one true God was, and uh, how to pursue him, how to love him, how to obey him. They are going to be learning that step by step by step by step, literally and figuratively. But they are going to be going into a nation who is in pursuit of their own gods, of which is very different, the small g, than what they are learning in the wilderness about their, the one true God. And they are being reminded, do not fall, fall or follow into the same path as those around you. Don't do it. So as we begin our, uh, uh, the first of the Ten Commandments, and, and it's not my intention to go over all of the, uh, the commandments. <laughs> uh, I think it's important for us to realize, in fact, I think if I already saw, the, I have the first couple of verses here of the Ten Commandments here in Exodus chapter 20. It begins, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any, unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. 
Why? For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now let me uh, uh, give you a, a a kind of a reality of, of what their gods were kind of like in, in that day and age. And I, I don't, I didn't necessarily understand that, this, until really going over my last class. Uh, I think there was some things, although it was not a fun class at all, uh, there were some things that were uh, interesting and revealing, I guess is how we'll say that. When I look at those first two, verse 2 and verse 3, oh, well, let me say verse 3 and verse 4, because verse 2 and 3 kind of go together. When I look at verse 3 and verse 4, I, in my opinion, previous was, oh, that was almost a repetition. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not make any graven image or likeness. Uh, and, and so ultimately, in fact, there's several that just combine that as into one command. Uh, it's one commandment. Others divide that into two commandments. Uh, I ultimately believe that, especially now in my understanding, maybe you guys already knew this, um, that those are very different commands. Uh, the first one, thou shalt not have no other gods before me, is, is very clear. Uh, God is saying, I am the one true God and there are no others. You shall not follow any other gods. Uh, and the second one, thou shalt not make any unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above and the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. In the day and age that they're being given this command, their idols were not, let me say it this way, they did not create gods with their hands. And I know that, that I hope makes sense. As they molded their gold, or even here very shortly as Aaron would melt the gold and create a calf. These were not, and especially in the case of this golden calf, this was not a God that they created with their hands as a means of, this is now my God, if that makes sense. And I, I didn't fully grasp that before. What they were doing is they would pick a, an end, literally what verse 4 says there. Something that is in the heaven, something that is in the earth, or beneath the earth, or in the water, under the earth. They would pick a, a, a creature, mold that as a representation of the God they served. So, for instance, Baal. Baal ultimately is, is a, a word that means a, a lord, ruler. Uh, but in many of, that, of their Canaanite regions that they would soon conquer, the Baal, as they would call it, would be one that was a... Uh, the God of thunder. And so many instances when they are talking about a Baal from this region, what is referencing is the God of thunder. So in their minds, it was a God that controlled the storms. And so this God was, was elsewhere, kind of a similar concept of our God. He was a God that was out there somewhere that one could not behold with the eyes, but they were able to see every time they heard the rolling thunder, they knew that is Baal. <laughs> That is this God sending down the storms to us, whether it be in judgment or whether it be in the needed rain for their, their harvest. But that is their God, Baal. Because they could not see that God, they would de depict a, 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 a graven image as a means to put a face, in essence, of the God. So this, this graven image did not replace their God. It was the means by which they were able to worship their God, if I can make that clear. Same thing, if you look at the wording in regards to the golden calf, it was not that they were looking to create a God. What they were doing when they asked Aaron to mold that, it was, hey, Moses is gone, we're not sure that he's ever coming back. We need something that will be as Moses was before our God. We need something that's going to be our God. We, we have to have something as a means to, how do we worship a God we cannot see? And Moses was our spokesperson before. He was the one that saw God, spoke to God, delivered the word to us from God. We have to have some device before us. We have to have something created for us. Now, what is spectacular in, in archaeological findings is that the in, inscriptions on some of these uh, idols that have been found, you know, there might be idols that all say Baal on them. It's obviously just a, a, a Babylonian word that means Lord, so they could be any God. But some of them would be exactly what verse 4 says. Some would be things of the air. Some would be things of the land. Some of the things would be of the sea. But they would all be to the same God. In my home, we have a goofy little dog. 
And uh, uh, our my daughter, Rebecca, loves that little dog, and that little crazy dog loves her, and then tolerates the rest of us. <laughs> if we were polytheistic <laughs> and served little Gs, and it was said, all right, we want, to, we want to come up with some form to worship this God. What, what should we create? I know what Becca's vote would probably be. I can tell you when, when she finds a shirt and it's got a paw print, well, that's what she loves. Uh, if, if she gets a notebook and it's got a paw print or a picture of a dog on it, that's what she's going to be directed towards. So if we can pick anything to create to represent this God that we cannot touch or see, uh, Rebecca's voice is going to be, hey, let's make it a dog. <laughs> Something that I, I'm endearing to. Now, if she's talking about the God of, of death, it's probably not going to pick a dog. <laughs> My in-laws have horses and have for quite some time. And those horses, obviously, because of all the responsibilities of having horses, dictate a lot of, of the time of their life. There's a lot of involvement in owning horses. And I would dare say if they were given the same choice, hey, we're going to make something that is going to representation of, of this God that we can't touch or see, what would you like it to be? And again, except in the case of death, <laughs> Uh, famine, all those type of forces that would have gods connected, they're going to say, hey, you know, how about a horse? And, and so in the region that they're about to in, in conquer and inhabit, there are gods that were created by hand that were not gods in and of themselves, but representations of those gods. Because they knew that there was this god. In fact, I've said this before, they had a god for every force of nature. If it rained, there was a God. If it snowed, there was a God. If there was thunder, there was a God. If there was flood, there was a God for that. If there was a harvest, there was a God for that. If there was a famine, there was a God for that. If there was sickness, if there was health, if there was death, every force of nature, every force within humanity had a God connected to it in a very polytheistic atmosphere as they are about to inhabit. And so they had, the realm of gods was limitless. But families began and communities began to place as their primary God. This is one that we really, this is one that we really need to rely upon. And this is the one we're going to strive to worship the most. This is the one that we have to have. The commandments here, the first two, says, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. No other gods. I am the, I'm alone. I'm a jealous God, verse 5 says. You're not going to have any others. Don't have any others besides me because there is only one. It is me. Verse 3, I am the Lord which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of man. No other God did that. No other God could do that. It was me that did that. You will have no other God besides me. Secondly, though, verse 4, don't make any graven image or likeness of the birds, the beasts, the fish. Don't make any image or likeness even of me to be a representation of me I already directed you're not going to have anything but me <laughs> two so don't make any representation even of me because that's exactly what Egypt did and that's exactly what Canaan did all of the kingdoms of Canaan Make gods, not to create a god, but as a means to worship the god they could not touch or see. And how easy it is for us to do the same today. Uh, I think I've already kind of stepped into my first point here. But no idolatry, or as I have in the parentheses, no the temptation of idolatry. is an idolatrous item, and I, I pretty much have already given my first point more than I intended to already. This item that they would create was not a replication or not a, a, uh, a creation of a new God, but it was a representation of that God. Look at verse 23. I already read to you the command. Now we'll get to verse 23. You shall not make... Well, let me go. You, you've, these first... Where does it end? Oh... Uh, Verse 17 is the end of the Ten Commandments. We have the, we finish out with coveting. Verse 17. And all the people, I'm just going to begin here where we leave off with the Ten Commandments. Verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightning and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, I love verse 19. 
They see all this that God is doing in the mountain. And Moses comes back down and they cry out to Moses and says, You speak to us. Don't let him speak to us. We, we can't do this. You speak thou with us and we will hear. Moses, whatever you say, we're going to listen to you. Don't leave us. So we have to deal with the one who just thundered from the mountaintop. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 20. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. In other words, what is Moses saying? There was a reason for all the thunders and the lightning and, and the smoke. There was a reason for all of that. Here's the reason so that you might know that there is only one God and that you might fear him. The people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt, shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven, and ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. He has just finished the Ten Commandments. And before the next chapter here, chapter 21, where he goes into a whole another round of, of commands and applications of those commands, God goes back to the first two and again it instills within them, in case you missed it, this is what this means. This is very important that you get this. I just gave you 10 basic commands, but God only reviews the first two. And he will do that again and again and again. And he will command Moses to remind them before they go to the promised land, here is what you have to know about the gods of the land that you're going to inhabit. Destroy them. Have nothing to do with them. For I alone am your God. Therefore, verse 23, you shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. Now, obviously, today we don't have within our churches, within our homes, I trust, uh, gods of silver and gods of gold that we have created as representations of the Almighty God. I, I hope we don't anyway. That that we that we almost worship, you know, for the pagans, they would what they would do before this graven image was what they intended on doing before this God they could not see or touch. And, and so if they would bow down to this image that they had created, it was as if they were bowing down to this God that they couldn't see. But how do you bow down to a God that you can't see? So here's an image to kind of help us. Here's what we're going to do this. But you know, I think there's some areas in our life where, especially in the chaos of the moment, that we try to simplify God to a, to a realm that we can get, if I can say it that way, to a realm that makes more sense to us. Kind of some, some thoughts here. There is a, a, a movement that has been around for quite some time, a, a come-as-you-are movement. And, and please don't think that it has anything to do with dress, your, your clothing. I don't believe that's what is being presented at the heart of, of this come-as-you-are. It is more of the God loves me the way that I am, which is true, but the intention is, therefore, I don't need to do anything about it. I don't need to grow. I don't need to mature. I don't need to study God's word and figure out what it is that's in my life that I shouldn't be doing and what it is that I should be doing. Uh, I don't need to have a clear heart like David that says, search me and try me. I don't need to have a heart of Paul that acknowledges, you know, the things I should be doing. I'm not. And the things that I shouldn't be doing, I am. Oh, but I need the grace of God in my life. Uh, there's a mentality today that kind of simplifies God to this uh, aspect of, it's all good. Now, who I am, it's just all good. And, and ultimately, while we don't have silver, we don't have gold fixtures, what we are doing is the same heart, the same mentality that says, we have a God that we can't see or touch. And I'm supposed to worship this God that I can't see or touch. And I have to figure out some way to make it a little more manageable to my mind. And to do that, I'm just going to have a God in my mind, in us sense, that isn't really as holy as holy is. That isn't really as almighty as almighty is. We're just going to be kind of hanging with Jesus. <laughs> well, we're, we're just going to have this kind of a, a kind of a buddy relationship. Me and my guy, we're just kind of going through life. And he doesn't expect anything from me because he just loves me the way that I am. Have we not in that mentality 
While we have not melted any gold or silver, have we not created a God that is more to our liking than that he truly is? Now, our God does love us. If we are his children, he loves us. If we are not his children, we are, as Colossians 1 says, we are enemies of him. We are the enemy. We have chosen to be his enemy because of our sin. But if we are his child, then obviously he loves us with a love that never ends. But in that love for us, he longs for us to obey him. He longs for us to grow in him. He longs for us to seek him. He longs for us to continue to acknowledge him as a God far greater than our imaginations could ever fathom. He longs for us to understand, as I don't have it on the screen there anymore, but as, as verse 2 said, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Our God, as it says later on, says, I am a jealous God. I want you to grasp me for all that I am. Don't reduce me. Don't have the temptation of reducing me so it's more manageable for you. My ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are far higher than your thoughts. We've got to leave a God as he is, the one true God who exceeds anything that we could form with our hands or make sense of with our minds. And it ought to lead us and direct us to be in such pursuits of that God that we're not diminishing him to something that is more manageable. We are in awe of him, of something that we will never be able to grasp. One day we will see him as he is. But I believe even in the, the eternities of heaven, we're still going to be standing there in awe of all that our God is. And our God, I believe, desires that we are always in that state. I don't think it's necessarily wrong, and there's a lot of Christian songs that have this where it kind of reduces God to, uh, you know, even what a friend we have in Jesus. And even just the wording there kind of puts us as a, uh, an amazing friend we have in Christ. But let us not sing that kind of a song with the mentality of, like my friends here on this earth, they just accept me for who I am and I don't need to change. In fact, probably if I changed, they wouldn't like me anyway. Our God is a God that longs for us to change. Our God is a God that says all things work together for good, for your good. In making you more like me. <laughs> you are about, our lives are to be about change, about becoming more like him as we stand in awe of a God who never changes. An idolatrous item. But then as well, the next couple of verses, we have an idolatrous process. Look at verse 24. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and thou shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. Verse 25. And if thou shalt wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it out of hewn stone, for it shall lift up thy for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou shalt thou have polluted it. But let me let me I'm gonna call this an idolatrous process. What I find fascinating about verse 24, an altar of the earth shalt thou make unto me. Do you know what the Egyptians did in regards to their worship of their gods, their polytheistic gods? What, what, what did Egypt do? In fact, they're still around today to a point. What did Egypt do in the worship of their god besides making graven images? Yes. They have this, I, this concept, the Egyptians did, that the higher they can go to God, the better and more righteous, the more zealous they are. And so as the pharaohs, as they're, especially the pharaohs, who are considered the, the mediators between the gods and the lowlifes of man, the pharaohs place themselves literally as lords. That's literally what a, kind of a pharaoh means. They, they are as lords. They're kind of the mediator between the gods and the people. And, and so they had that role, and as we consider the pyramids, they believe that as a means of worship, the higher the better. What do the Canaanites do? If you recall, in fact, think of Josiah. What was it that young eight-year-old King Josiah did when he took his reign? One of the first things he did, do you recall? He tore down high places. He tore down the high places. The Canaanites did, they worshiped their God in this way, that they would... They would build these altars that all had height. And I'm getting ahead of myself again, kind of combining this point and the next point, but they would have these altars of, of, of height and of great elaborate pyramids and great elaborate of, 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 of places of, of worship. 
Here's what God says to them. So these people are aware of Egypt. They're about to learn about the Canaanites. But they're very aware of the Egyptian practice. God says, when you make me an altar, make it on the dirt. Just mound up some rocks just right there on the earth. And the very next verse, verse 25, and I'll make an altar of stone now. In the land of Canaan, you pretty much, kind of like uh, if you've ever been into the Ozarks. I don't say that because we've been to the Ozarks many times. Uh, they're in uh, northern Arkansas. You pretty much have two areas, mostly a second area, which is very similar to Israel. You have areas of grass, which are far and few between, and you have areas of rock, just rock. I think there were times that my grandpa paid us, a, was it a penny a bucket, a penny a rock or something from his yard, the more rocks you could pick up out of his yard or his flower gardens. It was just all rock. Verse 25 says, if you're going to make me an altar of rock, which frankly, most of Canaan that they would inhabit was rock. If you're going to be building me an altar of rock, leave the rock as it sits. Don't, don't mold it, don't form it, don't inscribe it, don't do nothing with it. Build the altar right there on the rock where it sits. You know, almost as if it's a, uh, what God is saying is, when you worship me, number one, I want it to be simple. Especially they're wandering. What's the point of building this elaborateness and then you're gonna leave and go on? Make it simple. But as well, I believe what God is ultimately saying is, make your worship of me different make your worship of me different than what is the common realm of society around us make it so that it's not like the egyptians don't worship me like they worship their gods and when you go into the land of canaan don't worship me the way they worship their gods there is only one god i am it have no other god besides me but don't reduce me to something like they've reduced their gods don't reduce me to some form that you can grasp with your mind and see with your eyes and touch with your hands. Don't reduce me to that. Don't simplify me to something of man. Leave me as who I am. And even in the places that you worship me, don't do it like they do. Just on the dirt. If it's on the rock, don't change it. But I, what I also find interesting, it says here in verse 24 and 25, And altar of the earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice therein thy burnt offerings, and the peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen. It's afraid that I want to get to. In all the places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. Right after they crossed the river, the water, the sea, with the Egyptians in pursuit of them, what was the first thing Moses did? He built an altar. Time and time again in the days ahead, the weeks ahead, the months ahead, and as they would soon find out, the years, and decades ahead, altars would begin to be made as God, did, as God did amazing things for them, just like he already had. And in response to those amazing things, they would build an altar to set aside the very fact that this is what happened here. I can't imagine as they began to inhabit Canaan then and, and perhaps came across the, the, the very altar that Abraham had made upon which Isaac was laid. Now, I think that would be some awe-inspiring reality. This is the place. But God wanted them to understand, don't make it so elaborate. Don't make it like they've made it. Don't make pyramids for me. Don't make these places of, of great esteem and, and awe. Right now we know the temple is going to be amazing uh, here, decades down the road here. Uh, uh, but at this point, hey, don't, don't keep it simple. Keep it about me. I'm going to put it in the, in, the, in the modern day. Could you imagine if, well, today, I think there's maybe some chance of storms tonight, if I recall. Let's say those storms blew in right now. And right in the middle of the message, the tornado came to town and it destroyed, literally obliterated every building in town except this church. The only people that were spared in Toulon were those that were obviously out of town at this moment or that were in this building. Could you imagine as, as the storm cleared, we came out of the basement and we looked around town and there was not a single person living or a single building standing except this one. What would we do? 
No, I, I can tell you what uh, uh, some would do. They'd make a monument. This was a hand of God. What in the world just happened here? We'd make little night lights of the of the shape of this church building to sell. We would have literature. We'd have maps. We'd have we'd have blinking lights. We'd have this is the place that God spared when He destroyed everything else in this community. He spared this little building here in Tulan, and we'd have a monument out front saying, "Look what God did." Kind of like the, uh, not to the same extent, obviously, but the, 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 the little brown church in the veil. Uh, this would be a, 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 a historic place. This would be a, songs would be written about this building. What does God say? When I come and I do something that is so amazing and so spectacular that your mouth is left hanging wide open saying, Wow! Build me an altar there. Right on the dirt. Build me an altar right there on the rock. If it's on the rock, there's no dirt there. Just build it on the rock. But don't shape the rock. Don't mold it. Don't form it. Don't inscribe it. Just put an altar there for me. Because it's right there that I have come down and blessed you. Acknowledge that. But don't worship me the way that others worship me. You know, I... I, I, I stand humbly realizing that there are it is so easy obviously we're not talking about graven images in our day and age in our in our nation necessarily but we do live in a nation that is in pursuit of lower g gods and we do live in a nation that is in pursuit even in our worship of those little g gods and we've got to make sure that we're not reducing number one our god to something that we can manage don't reduce god to something that's manageable because he's not, he's not manageable. He's far beyond our imagination. But as well, we've got to worship this God in a way that is not the norm for worship. He deserves that of us. And while it is easy for us to begin to take on the, the norm of how people worship these days, their own gods or themselves, make sure that in, even in our worship it is it is different. Maybe even simple. But even in the time frame of the, the Solomon's temple and all of its grandeur, I believe that we still had a God, because a God can't change. A God that desired a heart of worship, not about buildings, but about hearts. And may we worship him in that regard. How often we come to a, an idolatrous process uh, in, our, in our worship. Now this last verse here, verse 26, I have to admit is uh, maybe it's just part of the odd part of me. And what's kind of funny even in saying that, my keyboard that I have at home for typing out my messages has very few keys left on it that have, some of them just have a little deep of, of white, just like a, like you sneeze white paint on it. And, and so you can't tell what the keys are. Quite some time ago, my wife bought me a, a new keyboard, but it, it, it clinks, it makes too much noise. And I like my other one because it's very soft touch keys. And, and so after a while, I just got, I, I didn't like how loud this other keyboard was, so I switched it back. And so I use a keyboard that literally has like no letters left on it. Some numbers up on top. And uh, I know how the keyboards are, are made that most of the, your more common letters are all in kind of a oval. Less used are more on the outside. And so a lot of my, what did you say, the circumference letters? Still, I can still see what those are. Everything in the middle, you just gotta know. So if you're a hunt and pecker kind of a typer, you'd never work on my uh, keyboard because there's, there's no, there's, all, the, all the letters are wore off my, my keyboard. Well, I literally in my, in my first, uh, I, I literally have written out, maybe it's just the odd part of me that I think this is funny, this verse. Uh, but D and F are really right next to each other on a keyboard, and, and uh, so when I typed it, I did F, F. That's, this is the off part of me, and maybe it's the same thing, off part, odd part. But look at verse 26. I, I find this strikingly odd, out of place, inappropriate, but it's our God. He says, Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Again, I was kind of combining the last, uh, the last point with this one, an idolatrous ignorance, even in the simplicity of, of the ignorance that often is overlooked. 
as the Canaanites would make high places for their worship. Steps, the pyramids, obviously high places in their worship. God is saying at the very end of verse 26, he's saying, don't make high places. In fact, when they come into Canaan, he would literally tell them again and again, don't make high places. Even of worship to me, don't make high places. Again, when King Josiah came on the, on the throne, his first task was he tore down all the high places that had been built, not only to the false gods, but even to the one true God. He tore them all down because God says, don't make high places. And sometimes it's easy for us to say, well, why does God require such things of us? Why does God make such requirements? Why can't I make a high place? They make high places to their God. The Egyptians make high places to their God. Our God is so much greater than him. Why can't we make it even a higher place to our God? I love that this verse says, ultimately this is what verse 26 is saying. God says, don't do it. Because as you're going up to worship me, people are going to see your nakedness. You're wearing robes. You're wearing these garments of their day and age. And as they go up, you can't stay modest that way. Don't do it. And I find just the simplicity of, of this command of verse 26, the why. A why is given, and it's not often given with God's commands. In fact, let me say it back up. Many times his commands are given a why, but it simply is because I am the Lord thy God. That's the why. Because I am the Lord your God. Don't do this because I am the Lord your God. Do this because I am the Lord your God. This one has the why, and it's a different one. It says, don't do this because you're going to be exposing yourself for crying out loud. Oh, i got to put those words in there. For crying out loud, you're going to be exposing yourself if you do that. Don't do that. You know, I, I fear that there are times in an idolatrous... And I know ignorance is a word that is often a, a very negative uh, connotation to it. We have an idolatrous ignorance that many times in our pursuit of our God, the one true God, many times we even overlook that which is just simple. We become so driven by what we think we have to have, by what we have to do, that the simple things are forgotten or, or uh, uh, neglected. We want bigger, we want better. We want to stand in awe of the majesty of our God and we want to come up with some way to figure out how to do that here on this earth. And in so doing, we neglect the simple things. Come on guys, you're wearing robes. You can't climb up steps to go worship me on this altar. Make the altar on the ground. It's on the rock, just build it right there. Don't shape it, don't form it, don't add to it. Build it there with no steps. Now, the argument is given, what about the temple? And, and the temple, if you look in the, the specifics that God gives about the temple, the, the altar is actually uh, uh, 10 cubic, 10 meters, so to speak, higher. But it's believed that there was a uh, more of a, a ramp that it kind of led up to it, as opposed to actual stair steps up to it. But again, we're looking at a temple, <laughs> uh, uh, generations yet to come, compared to what God that tells to these wandering Israelites today, don't, don't build me high places. <laughs> Let me tell you the why. I've already told you time and time again, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me. This one, don't build me high places, because it's about you. You're going to be exposing yourself. Why you do that? Don't do that. And, and uh, again, that idolatrous ignorance that at times comes place in, in, in our hearts and our lives, in our worship. I fear at times that churches, and when I say churches, I mean like the structures, the buildings, become edifices of our God. Now, I'm not saying that a large church, an elaborate church, a beautiful church is something that is wrong. But I think when we get this mentality of, this is what we have to have for our amazing God, if we can bring it down to earth, we can bring it down to our level, we can bring it down to... Uh, I'm not sure that that's what God is standing here. And I think there's some simple things that God's saying, why, why are you doing that for? I think there's times in our, our worship, in the worship of others, even in their true, the, the true God, that they are overlooking the simple, the obvious, in their pursuit of what they want, what they have to have. And how much is lost, how much is neglected, simply because we're in pursuit of what I want. And how much are we overlooking of just the obvious because of what we want? Lots of applications, and, and uh, I won't go over them because I think we can come up with them. I had several written down, but I'll just move on.
Do we understand what true worship is and how easy it is for us to fall into the temptation of idolatry? An idolatrous item? Let's reduce God. An idolatrous process? Let's make this elaborate. Let's make this big. Let's make this bigger and better than it's ever been before. God says, how about just make it about me? Let's make it simple. This is about me. What you do isn't going to impress me. The creator of the universe is not going to be impressed by a monument we make for him. What he is impressed by is a heart that truly desires to worship him. And don't forget the, <laughs> the simple things, the obvious things. Don't overlook them in the pursuit of what I want, what we want, what we think we have to have. So, in concluding, how, how does this apply to chaos? How does this apply to our, our problems? How does this apply to the COVID-19? How does this apply to whatever comes next? How does this apply to losing the job? How does this apply to, for instance, a tornado comes tonight and, and it does destroy this building? Maybe this is the only building that's destroyed in the storm. And everything else is standing. How are we going to respond to those trials? How are we going to respond to that next round of chaos? I think we have to, it begins with our understanding of who our God is. It begins with the first two commandments, the first two verses of these Ten Commandments. It begins with the reminder that God gave to them immediately following giving the Ten Commandments. And, and the very reality that he continues to give them again and again. Don't, don't, don't do this. Don't pursue other gods. I alone am your God. Don't build high places. Tear them down. Paul addresses the very same thing to first, in 1 first Corinthians, the church of Corinth in 10. We've gone over these verses before. There's no temptation. There's no chaos. There's been no uh, realm of modern day life today. But such is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. Again, I know I sound like a broken record at times, but that does not mean God will never send something that is beyond our means. What that means is here is the way that we, it's not above that we are able. Because with that temptation, he will make a way to an escape. And that doesn't mean that when we have problems come our way, that God will remove them. Because God's way of an escape is found in this last phrase, that you might be able to not run from it, hide from it, escape from it, but that you might be able to bear it. Regardless of what we face in the future, know that you're not the first one to face the situation. And as you're facing this circumstance, this COVID-19, this disaster, this medical diagnosis, this whatever it is, whatever that is, no, you're not the first one that has to deal with this. You're not. But know this, this is about a God who is always faithful. Don't make this simple about yourself. Make this, remind yourself about the amazingness of our God. God is faithful. Who will not suffer to be attempted above that you are able, if I can say it this way, if you, that you are able to see him, the faithful God, through the storm. Nothing will ever come upon our lives that requires of us to not see God. We will never face a situation in our life, no matter how big, that we have no other recourse than to lose sight of our God. Because God is a faithful God. Who will, with that temptation, make a way for you to be able to bear, and even in the bearing of it, escape from it? Which is why Paul would then say, three seasons, I asked <laughs> that this, this uh, 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 thorn in the flesh would be removed from me. Did God remove the thorn in the flesh from Paul? Nope. It was something that for three seasons of life, Paul went before the face of God and begged for God to take it away from him. God never did. But God taught him how to bear it. And that bearing, learning how to bear it, was Paul's escape because he was able to say, therefore I glory in infirmity. Bring it on. This is amazing. I've learned who my God is. I've learned this grace is always sufficient. And I glory in infirmities. God's not taking it away from me. I have learned how to glory in it because of his grace for me. But you've heard me say this. The very next verse then says, verse 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, why would it say flee from idolatry? What does that have to do with verse 13 and verse 12 and 11 and 10 and 9 and 8 before it? Because the wherefore, there's a direct connection to what had just been said. 
The direct connection is, you no, know, the problems that we have in life don't cause us to go out and melt some gold to make a graven image. That, that's not what happens here. But what does happen here is we begin to change who God is in our minds. Not for the good, but for our benefit. What does happen is we begin to put ourselves in a higher position than what we ought to be. What does happen when we face those kind of temptations, we forget the faithfulness of our God, and we try to figure out the way to escape it. What does happen is, is we want our God to be this for us right now. And God says, I am not this for you right now because you're trying to limit me. You're trying to, you're trying to diminish me. I am this. I will always be this. And I can never be anything but this for you. Don't try to limit me because you think I have to be. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, going all the way back to the children of Israel standing at the bottom of the Mount Zion in great fear saying to Moses, please tell us what he said because we don't want to have to hear from him. I am the God that did that for you. Don't diminish who I am in your hearts. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your word. I thank you for who you are. I pray that we would be reminded of, of who you are uh, in the midst of the storms. That we'd be reminded of the challenge of the nation of Israel as they are leaving a very polytheistic uh, region and certainly heading into one that may even be worse. And how often they fell to fall into the same cycle of what was going on around them, worshiping you in ways that the others worship their gods. I pray that you would remind us how easy it truly is for us to even do that yet today. Even in the midst of our trials, as we just looked at here in 1 Corinthians, when we try to demand of you in our own means, in our own way, to be what we want you to be instead of who you really are. And I pray that we'd be standing in awe of your faithfulness, standing in awe of your goodness, standing in awe of who you really are in all of your essence. Now, even in that storm, we're able to rejoice like Paul did and say that we glory in infirmities because we grasp the grace that you give to us. That you are always faithful to give to us. It means, gives us the means by which we can bear and even rejoice in those trials because you are that kind of God, not the God that we try to make you to be. And I thank you for what you are, who you continue to be. And I pray that we live lives to bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.